I don't think uni necessarily suited me. Like had this itch of like, I want to start a business and I didn't necessarily know what it was going to be in. Right. But I would just have ideas. In order to beat the game, you have to play the game. Capitalism is yeah. an infinite game. Yeah, it is to be fair. Yeah. Jeff Bezos sets his alarm clock every morning to go into work to make more money. I think everyone needs to give themselves a title and a mission that gets them up in the morning. Welcome to the Takeoff Experience where I sit down with highly driven people to talk about their journey, their failures and their successes. If you want to take off in your career, your business, your finances or your mindset, then this podcast is for you. Welcome back to the Takeoff Experience. We have a special guest in the building. It's been a few years actually since you've been in the podcast, right? Yeah, maybe one or two. Two years, yeah. You know what? I kind of owe you this one because the last one, we had massive audio issues and I promised you that. And yeah. I remember I promised you that. I remember. Yeah, I always keep my promises. What do they say in, in Game of Thrones? Uh, Lannister always repays their debts. I always repay. <laughs> Everyone always repays his debts. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, how you doing? In this present moment, I'm actually feeling a bit ill. I hope it doesn't yeah. come through on the episode. But um, yeah, th- life is good. Most things are, are going well yep. in my life. And um, yeah, just focusing on the stuff I can control, focusing okay. on being happy, focusing on my health. I wanted to um, maybe like suggest one rule for this pod, yeah, which is that you can ask me anything that mm. you want and, and I have to answer it honestly. Okay, okay, I love that. <laughs> I like that rule. Wow, that is amazing. Yeah. Okay, so my first question for you is, and um, you might remember this actually, I might have been doing this at that point. Who is Timmy? Wow, that's a... That's a really, that's a really deep question. Mm -hmm. I suppose I'm, I'm many things. I am, I think foremost, foremostly I'm, I'm someone who is trying to navigate life as best as they can and trying to understand why I'm here and like my purpose and, and how to help. Okay. Um, and I think that as time goes on, educating people about money teaching people about how financial systems work and doing it in a way that's inclusive and accessible seems to be working that seems to be what's allowed me to get to where i am today um secondly i am i guess a a group of skills you know like i I can do graphic design i can analyze data like i also know about money stuff i can i've been pouring a lot of uh, a time and effort into public speaking and kind of stand up comedy and stuff. So I am the things I can do. But then also I'm a a, a son, a brother. Uh, I I was a husband, but we can talk about that too. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. 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 You really want to talk about? It? Okay. Cool. Yeah. We, 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 we look no whole bars like you said. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but let's uh, dial it back a little bit. So mm. we'll talk about your story a bit. Where are your parents from? My parents are from uh, mm. Nigeria. Okay. Yoruba family. Are you? Are you Yoruba? No, no. I'm. I'm Ijo and Ibo. Ijo and Ibo. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, but we're brothers anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, All Nigerians. <laughs> yeah. And um, they both, actually, my, my mom was actually born here. My mom was born in the UK. Okay. Um, and then she spent a little bit of time here as a child and moved back to Nigeria. So that's essentially where they both were brought up and grew up. And then I was actually born in the States. That's so interesting. Because my dad okay. was in the army and he mm. had an army training. And then he went to the States with my mom. I was born in a military hospital. Seriously? Uh, yeah. Wow. And uh, I think in the first few, in the first year of my life, I spent some time in the States and in Nigeria. And then I came here when I was about one-ish. Okay. Yeah. Do you know why they decided the UK out of all of those places? I'm, I'm, I mean, my guess is just, you know, like opportunity, infrastructure, mm. um, yeah, I think that's why. Wow, you could have been an American. <laughs> I, I I am well, an American. You, are you? You got the the whole thing. I look the plan. <laughs> I I I'm, I have a U.S. passport. Oh, okay. So I'm, you are I, an American. I was yeah. American until age twenty. Ah, oh. and then I um I tried to apply 
for a job because at uni mm. i didn't get like the full student loan that i needed so a lot of my entrepreneurial streak came from when i was at university right okay and um i, I used to run a graphic design business i would make logos and flyers for acs's around the country okay uh, pick maker it was called and um that's how i paid for a lot of stuff like throughout throughout that's uni insane. um and i wanted okay. to go for a job at a swine flu call center uh, during one of my summer holidays and they wouldn't hire me so i did a british citizenship test in warwick age like 19 20 and um, they asked me all sorts of questions about queen elizabeth and like big ben and like stuff that people who lived in this country wouldn't even know about um and i've been i've been dual citizen since then but yeah like i think my my long-term plan is like once i've uh seen off uh mr money john yeah. you know apply for the u.s presidency <laughs> you're serious no. you're gonna <laughs> okay wow you never know right but yeah like, i mean right? like, weird, weirder things have happened yeah wow that's so so interesting okay wow and okay so you you mentioned that you obviously moved to the uk um what area did you grow up mostly in in the uk grew up in southeast london okay um but if i could like that's when i was as a baby but yeah. when i think about where i grew up properly as a child clapham yeah okay i actually learned how to ride my bike in clapham common right as a kind of as a teen croydon uh, i went to school in croydon okay and then as an adult i've edged slowly up the northern line so i started in tooting and then i ended up in elephant and castle basically wow wow so you just like pretty much all south but just yeah, southwest yeah. south bits of south southeast London. how did you find it growing up because you in in south because you it seems like you were in a lot of different areas so yeah. how, how did you find it i was so, i i was patriotically a south londoner like i for me like south was like the place to be i had many kind of lots of childhood memories of like going ice skating and yeah. in Stratham ice rink oh, yeah, and going to ice rink. uh whitgift center with my friends after school and stuff and I was like, you know, if if it's not South, I don't want to know. And as time has gone on mm. and I've kind of seen what's happened, particularly to like Croydon Town Centre, has been a bit upsetting because um, that, that's an area that I would have wanted to see get the a similar amount of investment to, say, Shepherd's Bush or, or Stratford. Like those places are very different yeah. to um, how it was when I was younger. But because um, I was saying my, my younger brother is um, he's he's at secondary school now. OK. And I had to tell him, like, unfortunately, Croydon Town Centre is like worse now than when I went to school. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. It, to be fair, like I worked in Croydon for a year, a few years ago. And I was like, wow, it's so it's, Croydon is such an interesting area. It's like it's like a mix of different types of people into one you go into west you go to west Croydon, and you're like wow this is so different from east south Croydon. like how is this possible like what's yeah. going on here like yeah it's one of the most populous boroughs in, yeah. in london i miss Croydon a lot i, I love Croydon, and mm. um yeah just my hope is that as time goes on it can kind of resolve some of the the council can resolve some of the financial is, issues they've been having so that it can get the love it, it deserves yeah 100 percent. yeah and okay so school what school was it what area were you schooling in at the time as well um so i went to dulwich college actually okay. um oh yeah 69 yeah okay i mean, I mean that's that's how i feel <laughs> so there have been times when i've gone past yeah. the uh the school mm. like grounds camp camp i was gonna say campus where it kind of is like that and i've seen like the clock tower and like the the rugby pitches and stuff and like i can't believe that that's the school that i went to but yeah i got in on a bursary and a scholarship okay. which i think helped with the uh, uh, uh the costs and stuff and then uh due to you know changes in circumstances with my uh family i then um, moved from dulwich um and went to wellington county grammar school so i went to okay. two secondary schools wow um i have friends from both uh schools but my my main group of friends my longest standard group of friends are from from dulwich college wow so you went to really good schools both are well, I don't know much about Wellington, but you said grammar school, so I'm going to assume that is a, is a good grammar school, mm. right? Yes, it, How, it was a good school at the time. It's still a yeah. good school, yeah. How did you find it? Like, for yourself Dulwich. personally, yeah. I think um, at the time, Dulwich was very normal, like very fun. Um, it's only as I've gotten older that I've appreciated, like, what I was actually, like, what that school was actually like. Yeah. 
I think like Nigel Farage's son was like in, in school at the same time really? as us or oh, something. Wow. Yeah, so there were kind of there were different kind of networks and things going on. But in terms of me and my friends, we were we were all from the same background. Um I have a group of ten or so friends, um, most of us from African or Caribbean backgrounds. Uh one one of us is um like white British, and um we all just like clung together. And it was just a normal teenage stuff, you know, like MC, MCing in the playground, okay. and like playing football. <laughs> I and, love that. Yeah, just kind of causing mischief and stuff. Uh, but I did, I didn't recognize. But now, now I, now I'm like, oh wow, I just like met all the black people and became friends with them. But at the time, you don't think that's happening because e everyone's talking to everyone. Yeah. The differences show themselves a bit more over time. Yeah. Wow. That's so interesting. And at school, did you? Were you focused in school? So in terms of, did you enjoy school? Was it, did you feel like it was for you? Did you like to study or not? I liked to study, mm. yeah. I preferred studying to exams. Okay. Never really got on with exams, but I would take a deep interest in the things that I was studying. At school, I loved religious studies. I loved philosophy. I loved uh, like maths mm. as well, even though I didn't do that well at it at GCSE. Okay. I kind of with maths, I um, really liked it at school, and then in I would say like my teenage years and my early adulthood kind of like separated from it a bit. But now I'm back like on it, right? Like I use maths every single day in, in yeah. my job and stuff, and then I'm an ambassador for national numeracy as yeah. well. So that's been an interesting <laughs> full circle moment. It's crazy because it on the one hand you could say maybe not that like maths shouldn't be taught at school but maybe actually it just takes an element of maturity we all need to mature to get to grips with it a little bit more not that we shouldn't be exposed i, I agree that we should definitely be exposed at a young at the age that we are now but maybe we shouldn't um what's the word i'm trying to look for we shouldn't resign somebody say okay they're not good at maths at school they're not good at maths at college that means they're done with it right because like like you said right now that's something that you do you love it you absolutely love it but maybe then maybe you wasn't there yet and that's fine right yeah. it's, it's okay to have your own journey okay so so you went to college then you went to university what what did you end up studying at at university law like a law, good okay. like a good nigerian boy <laughs> is what you told to study law yeah <laughs> that's so funny i i just, just like, <laughs> ge gentle pressure yeah, applied okay. over a long period of time wow that's great i did law too so uh, I, it's crazy because i feel like did you want to study it no <laughs> here and there i think yeah. I, I think i had a mild interest in in law but would i say i was passionate about it no not really i don't mm -hmm. think i would say that i was passionate about law i think i only had two options science like biology physics chemistry or law basically so basically medicine or law that was my options right yeah. so yeah i went down the I mean, those are the options available to any young Nigerian person. It's like doctor, lawyer, accountant. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> it's crazy. I'll right? be studying media. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yo, well. Yeah. It must be said that like of like our parents mm. are it's like being done with love and it's being yeah. it's it's coming from a place of look, if you're gonna study something, study something that has longevity and that has skills that will be needed in like the everyday world right yeah. so I, I understand where it's coming from it's just very interesting doing what we do now yeah i don't even know if content creator was really a thing 10 like 15 years ago really no. the rate of change in society is so rapid yeah that's actually very difficult to say now you know to my to my youngest brother um who's looking to go to uni like next year what he should be studying what he should yeah. be doing i think that fundamentally the job of school now given how much new information there is should be to teach young people how to learn yeah that's a good point I like how that. to assimilate how to analyze and how to um like apply information yeah. basically yeah wow so you mentioned uh whilst you were studying law uh, that you set up a business right yes what uh, what year was it in your first year second year third year oh that's a good question i think i got started in my first year but okay. i think i i really got into it in my second year that's when i made the most um money i think i made something like five thousand pounds in really? my second year of uni yeah. wow from designing stuff and 
if I'm being very honest, like I bet I barely went to uni. I I had a lot of mental health challenges at at, at uni um, mm. in second and third year. Actually, so so much so that I actually had to take time out of um, third year mm. and uh, took a few months out, and then came back in my fourth year, and then finished uni. Then, and this is back when we weren't really talking about mental health or mm. didn't really recognize uh, things like anxiety and depression and stuff. Looking back, I can see that that's what was going on. And I'm really thankful to, um, I think I think her name is Helen Toner. She's mm. kind of like the pastoral care person in the humanities department. She met with me in April of 2010 and uh, like gave me a uh, compassionate leave and allowed me to take uh, that time up. Wow. Well, do you know, at the, well, now you probably know, what what was the reason, cause for that? Cause for the mental health issues? Was it the studies? Was it something else? I think, um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd had some, uh, sort of breakdown in the family happen like way 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 before like okay. when, when I was kind of 10 10 11 uh, years old my, yeah. my parents aren't together anymore um, I wasn't really enjoying my course I was in a relationship at the time that wasn't a particularly happy one and I think uni was the first time and also university was when I like came to identify as a, as an agnostic right I was brought up in a Christian um, household okay. But I had I went on this almost spiritual journey, and I think uni is such that uh, it's like the first time when you're kind of left alone with your thoughts and to think about things a lot. And yeah. I think that kind of got on top of me. Looking back at it, though, I am very like grateful for that period of time because I, I would say that that's when I experienced the most growth as a person. Yeah, okay. um, all of these things happen for a reason. Wow, that's really really interesting and. You're right about mental health. I don't think I really, not that I didn't acknowledge it, but it wasn't like a discussion that we were definitely, we weren't definitely having that discussion at a uh, university. So I'm, I'm happy that you recognize that there was something going on, even though it wasn't a discussion that we were ha having at the time and that somebody also recognized and gave you the support and allowed you to um, go away. I guess my question is, why did you, did you decide to come back to uni? Did you feel like you had to complete, complete uni? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I was nearly at the end, right? Okay. Like when I spoke to Helen, it was literally the month that my exams were due to take place. Yeah. So I got given some additional time to study. Otherwise, I would have failed them, right? So right, she, okay. she essentially gave me some extra time to study. Yeah. Um, I that that summer holiday uh, worked at CEX armed with my new British passport. I could finally get a job, worked at CEX in Croydon, went abroad as well on, on the holiday, first holiday, one of the first holidays I'd had in years mm. actually, and then returned um, in the in the January of 2011 and, and like finished my, my, my course. Amazing, amazing, amazing. How did you feel at that point? Did you feel like it was a sense of relief? Because I feel like uni is such like this massive obstacle. I mean, when you probably look back at it now, like uni, you're like, oh, was it as difficult as they make it seem? But I guess it's, it's all a development point. How did, how did you feel about it after you after you completed it? Yeah, no, I realized something. It was January of 2012. I was just doing the, the time in my head. How did I feel when I um, completed it? Yeah, just like good riddance. Like, thank goodness that that's over. <laughs> definitely really yeah. you really didn't enjoy it i didn't enjoy it at all wow um, i it just wasn't it wasn't for me um, yeah i and it's really funny like all the stuff that i do with finance and stuff yeah. now i wonder what it would have been like if i'd done like a financial degree but uh, do you know it's just i don't think uni necessarily suited me you hear these stories of people who drop out and stuff and, yeah. and i completely get it i think i've always been entrepreneurial at heart i've yeah. always wanted to tr try different things. Even in my yeah. business today, I'm not just doing one thing. I'm kind of have quite a short attention span sometimes okay. and, and can be quite a generalist. So again, again, back then, there wasn't much of a conversation around if you don't want to go down the uni route, what kind of tried and tested paths are there for you to go down? And yeah. I think that's still a conversation that we're having today when it comes to education. 100%, 100%. And it's an important one that you have to have. There is nothing wrong I think people are now starting to see there's other options. Mm. Maybe doing an apprenticeship is a bit more practical. Maybe that's more for you. Maybe just start working right well, straight away. Yeah, right? go straight into work. Business. Yeah. Business know? as well. Yeah, yeah. These options are definitely, I think, now more spoken about, which I'm um, grateful for, because I think having just the one route, 
Some people are just going to fall either side and think that they're failures because they fall on either yeah. side, which isn't true. And the, the way that you're examined as a kid isn't necessarily the most representative of real life either, yeah. right? Like for anyone who's failed a driving test or some kind of professional qualification, you fail, you pay a bit of money, you take it again. But in school, there's this steady marching forwards. Yeah. And like you're compared to your peers, right? Your grade is in relation to everyone else. So it's actually quite pressurizing what we do yeah. to people in the first in the first 20 or 20, 21 years of their life, I think yeah. there's like no rush, right? You've got the rest of your life. Exactly. I, I completely agree. So what did you end up doing after uni? Did you go into work or did you start a business? I had a year of uh, kind of looking for jobs, okay. kind of doing internships and like being on job seekers and that sort of thing. Mm. I actually found my slips from that the other day. It was like really, <laughs> really, it was like 50 pounds a week or something. Oh my God, 50 uh, pounds a week. Yeah, I remember uh, I would go for um, kind of weekly or bi-weekly like meetings at the job center and stuff. But then I finally got my first job um, at a PR company, a financial PR company okay. um, in, in the city. And then that's where I first got properly interested in finance because a lot of the clients were financial ones. Okay. I was on the research team and it was my job to kind of crunch numbers, spend a lot of time in spreadsheets, um, write press releases and stuff. And because I wanted to be good at my job, I wanted to understand what how the clients worked as well and there's a lot yeah. of banks insurance houses and investment houses as well that's so interesting so you kind of fell into it by accident almost right? it was a bit of an accident yeah but i think everything happens for a reason yeah i i think so too i think i think so too you might have not known it but you clearly unlocked something at that point and then whilst you were working at the pr firm i guess where did you know the idea around mr money jar come in where, where did that start to, to come into play so i bit, did a bit of time in a pr company Second job was at a marketing company, yeah. um, again, slightly bigger and kind of broader clients, but I did get to work on some financial products, uh, projects there. But the entire time I was working, I um, like had this itch of like, I want to start a business and I didn't necessarily know what it was going to be in. Right. But I would just have ideas every single week, like different business ideas and stuff. And so I left my second job in um 27 no no i joined in 2017 i was there for a year so i left my second job in 2018 with the aim of starting up an app like a, a finance app right. a bill management app actually that yeah. i know you to subscribe to and manage all your bills in one place i worked on that for a year didn't work out and then i started mr money jar right, uh, in okay. 2019 and at the same time i was also working as um a finance manager for a charity so i'd work okay. four days a week as finance manager and then on the extra day and on evenings and weekends i would build mr money jar as well wow and then after a year of doing that i i left uh that that charity in 2020 with their blessing i still have a great relationship with them and i've been full-time on mr money jar ever since wow that's crazy you know what i was gonna ask you right because you know when somebody there's a lot of people that want to be entrepreneurs right yeah and they start a business first one doesn't work out and they don't necessarily do a second one i guess for you why did you do a set, why do you like, okay, the finance app didn't work. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start Mr. Money Joe. What was like the, I guess, the drive to be like, you know what, I'm going to keep on going. Sure. So the two ideas are actually related. Okay. So, so the finance app was around me seeing if I could build a product to reach people through, through a financial product. But the Mr. Money Jar idea was like, okay, fine. If I'm not going to be the product, then why don't I be the person who talks about them okay and through the time that i spent at the marketing company my second job we actually did influencer projects there that was the oh, first oh. time i heard the word influencer was okay. in 2017 and i actually call myself an influencer <laughs> i prefer to go content creator but yeah. yeah that's what we called them and we would find we would have clients over here and then we'd go on uh, social media websites and we'd find people and do research on them and pitch them to clients and like put these projects together. I was like, wow, okay, so you can be online and marketing companies will just like stalk you basically and suggest you to like these big like global clients for projects and stuff. I was like, there's something in that. And uh, I, when the, the app I did didn't uh, work out, I, I revisited that. Okay. So I was like, if I just took, and, and also this coincided 
with me having like a huge personal development push. So in 2017, I keep a book diary. I, I read 37 books, most of which were on the topic of personal finance wow. and investing. And that was, I hadn't really read that much uh, in, in the years leading up to that. So I almost feel like I was playing catch up for the reading I hadn't done. Wow. Um, and I was like, okay, I feel like I've got a good solid foundation of financial knowledge. Let me uh, set up a, a, like an online platform and talk about it. The very first thing I did was a blog, which no one read. <laughs> and so okay, I decided cool. to go on to um, yeah. Instagram and start posting. And I did my first ever post in uh, July 2019. Wow, wow. And it's so crazy that you said blog, because what I'm learning from you talking about what you're talking about, your story, a lot of pivoting. And you weren't scared to pivot. You weren't scared to use your creativity, which I think is amazing, because I think that's the essence of being an entrepreneur. You have to keep on if something not necessarily that something doesn't work out but if there's a better way to to do something you you find that way and it sounds like that's what you're doing start off with blog okay cool I've, I've given it maybe this is not the right format okay let me go and create content on instagram okay this is this yeah. seems to be working yeah i think in entrepreneurship the idea of getting getting to know as quickly as as possible is is really important so if you have an idea you literally have no idea whether it's going to work or not. Yeah. So the idea is to fail as quickly as possible, take the learnings from the last experiment and apply them to the to the newer one. And um, that journey never actually stops either. Um, you, you need to constantly be trying out new things, seeing what sticks, seeing what doesn't, and then moving forward with, with what works. Yeah. And, try and try and have fun with the process as yeah. well, right? Like I didn't go onto Instagram purely because it, because uh, it worked like I actually enjoyed designing stuff and yeah. like, making content as well yeah why why the name Mr Manager where did that come from yeah that's a great question I actually took a lot of time to come up with the name I wanted a name that was like accessible to people that gave almost like a vibe of like you know conserving your money building wealth saving money um, my name's Timmy Merriman Johnson. So Mr. MJ is like kind of like a double entendre. Okay. And um, and like randomly, I, I found out the other day that like Mr. Money Jar is a letter for letter anagram of Merriman Joe. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's just like... <laughs> that's like destiny or something, yeah, right? Yeah. It just... Uh, yeah. So, um, and I remember I, I, I came up with the name. I bought the trademark yeah. again in, in 2019. And uh, my aim... For Mr. Money Jar is just to be able to put that brand on anything, whether it's a piece of merchandise, whether it's a piece of content, whether it's like a documentary or yeah. anything, and just have it be a trusted piece of like financial uh, information or product. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. I love that. That's crazy. Death of Destiny, man. <laughs> so I remember as well in the early days, you uh, did a live. You started doing an Instagram live. Uh, and you miss the money jar show that's what you called it at the mm -hmm. time right what was the inspiration for that i think we've had andy i am on this show before haven't we? yes yeah so the first live i ever did was with him was it yeah oh my god i don't, I don't remember yeah. i don't remember that, that yeah, was we, him. we 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 made no no so he invited me onto a live with him oh okay. um, uh, yeah shout out andy he's a great great, great guy, guy. Yeah, great yeah. great friend and I remember being really terrified at the time, but I think it was like a new feature that had just been launched yeah. on Insta and he wanted to try it. We did the live together and uh, yeah, like it wasn't terrible. So I thought, cause at that time, like summer of 2020, everyone was at home and on their phones. And 100%, yeah. You had all this upheaval going on with like people's finances and stuff. So I thought it would be interesting to speak to people from uh, within the industry and to like serve the audience that way. And yeah, did like a hundred of the lives, each uh, one of them a conversation with, uh, actually there were some people who came on, uh, came on more than once, but like most of them a conversation with a new person. So it was a great way to like build up my skills as a speaker. I've always historically been quite shy and introverted. So each live I did, I was like learning how to speak okay in front of people Interesting. Um, get to know people within the industry i really uh, i think like investing in people and relationships is like the most important relationships are the most important asset yeah um over any kind of financial product or like building it's definitely people and yeah it was a good way to to reach people at the time because everyone was on social 
Yeah. And it was great. I rem- I remember that. And I remember that you were you were consistent. I mean, to do 100 episodes, that's like... Two years. Almost two. That's two years, right? Yeah. Every Monday is tough. Mm. Live. It's not pre-recorded, like where you can do a batch. Five in one week is literally every Monday. But the story, you know, my journey to this point in time mm. has sort of been, you know, just a series of kind of full circle moments and kind of things adding up yeah but me not realizing until after the fact so what i didn't realize when i was doing those lives was that i was actually preparing myself to appear on uh live news interviews okay and so by the time th- this is what i want to kind of say to everyone like if you're doing something and it doesn't seem that useful at the time you're still learning even if you don't realize it or not. Yeah. So when the call came from ITV News to react to the autumn statement last November, I was very, very calm in that scenario because okay. I've done I've done the hundred lives. Like I've had stuff go wrong. I've had people's children appear um, like on screen. I've had cat, like people's cats like jump into the thing. So <laughs> I just, I wasn't phased at all. Yeah. And I'm not phased at all by uh, kind of live television appearances or speaking on stage live as well. In fact, I feel more comfortable in live settings than yeah. I do in like, okay, you need to say this thing and it's like a pre-recorded thing. Yeah. Wow. And you know what's crazy, right? Is that I was thinking, was that like, even though you said that you didn't realize it, it, it sounds like it wasn't part of your plan to go onto live TV. It was kind of something that just happened naturally. Yeah. Not Nothing Nothing about what I'm doing is planned. Okay. It's just... That's cool. Yeah. Nothing about... <laughs> None of, none of this was like supposed to happen. Yeah. Um, it's just a series of short, small scale experiments. You yeah. try something for the fun of it, see if it works. And then if it does work, you fan the flames, you do, you do it a bit more. Yeah. And um, yeah, I obviously have like goals and things that I want to achieve. But all of the best things that have come my way, whether it's television appearances, whether it's brand partnerships, I'm writing a book at the moment, Mm -hmm. they've all happened organically. And uh, I want to keep it that way. Yeah, that's nice. How do you, I guess, for the listeners and watchers, right? Because there's some people that might be very um, impatient Mm -hmm. and might want like instant success or they might want to force things a little bit. How, how, How did you... I guess, when did you make that decision that, look, I'm going to just do this organically. I'm going to see where things go. Did you, did you make a conscious decision? Do you know if you did or? Yeah. 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 There's a great Ted talk talking about like what enables, um, the biggest single lever that has enabled like some of the world's most successful companies to succeed. And, um, they looked at lots of different uh, like factors, like kind of the team and the idea and, and so on. But like the single biggest thing was timing. Okay. It was just like when the, the time when the business was launched. And the example that was used, if I remember correctly, was YouTube. It was like lots, there were lots of different video streaming ideas that came along before YouTube. But YouTube had like the right people, the right concept, the right execution, but also happened to launch at a time when internet speeds were fast enough to enable you to have that video streaming experience and stuff. So I think that when it comes to wanting to like achieve success, I'm a big believer in like what being, what is for you, not going past you. And you just need to have your bread and butter, like day to day way Mm -hmm. of like making money and reaching people until the timing comes along yeah. and then everyone will just call you an overnight success but like yeah. of course you know you've been doing it for x however many months or years yeah 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 i i completely i completely agree i don't know if there's any and maybe aside from people on tiktok that has achieved overnight success unless you go on britain's got talent maybe or x factor and even that is not really overnight that's, success, is it? That's someone honing their craft yeah. for ages. Yeah. To then be able to audition to get like a golden buzzer true. or whatever the case may be. Yeah. And also I think like, yeah, in, in life you've just got time. Yeah. You know? Like I I fundamentally think that life is about having fun. Yeah. I don't I don't think life needs to be like hard or difficult in any way i think it's about like having fun loving people Mm. doing doing what you enjoy yeah making the world a better place 
let everything else that's going to happen happen like it will, it will probably do you be given enough time mm. if you're going to be successful it will happen anyway yeah, yeah and i really i love stories of people who actually they get their break like a lot later on like two examples that come to mind for me are like keanu reeves yeah he was 35 okay. when he appeared in the first matrix really yep. wait was that his first big break kind of that's what put him on the map yeah that's true actually yeah. he, was, he was 35 years old wow which is like quite a way right it's mm, quite different in, in acting world yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, chadwick boseman yeah. um i believe he was 41 in Bla in the first black panther wow that's absolutely insane i believe he was i hope yeah. i got that right so i look at people like that and i'm like yeah you might you know get your break in your early 20s as is the like popular narrative at the moment or you might be in your mid-30s your 40s or even your your 50s Anne Bowden, yeah um uh founder of starling she's like in her 50s now i believe and she's, yeah. she's running the company that way so just try and have fun in the meantime yeah amazing amazing so for you i don't know if we if i ask you this question what's like i guess because obviously you, you you started the app but what's what do you think's been like the driving force for you to continue going and to to be patient and you know to i actually head over to success what's been the driving force for you i i care a lot about people's finances okay. i genuinely do um, I, I didn't think that I, I would, but I feel like I'll answer this question a bit of like a roundabout way. So some data came out either last year or the year before based on the 2021 census that said that in the UK, less than half the population is religious. Okay. And I remember reading that and thinking, no, this is a very religious country. Um, it's just that the religion is called capitalism. <laughs> like that is the uh and we all worship yeah in the products and services of the world's billionaires and multimillionaires which yeah. are the gods of the religion yeah and many of us um spend a lot of time doing stuff that we don't actually like to earn money just so that we can like pay for very very basic things food shelter and what have you and actually in this current climate we're in the work you're doing isn't even like enough to cover your costs right and that just seems wrong to me because you only live once and it just seems like a massive waste to spend your life doing things or with people that you don't love or that you don't enjoy um but in order to beat the game you have to play the game yeah and i'm here to show people to be almost like a cooperative partner to be <laughs> like this is how you play the game this is how money works this is how you save. This is how investing works. Yeah. So that you can solve for money and live the life that you want to live. Yeah. Completely agree. It is a game. And like you said, you have to, unfortunately, you have to play the game. But then when you play the game, I think you can get out the game. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's some, what it is. Some people want to play the game forever. Yeah. Some people enjoy it. Some some people, uh, that's not me at yeah. all. Um, you want to get out of the game. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Want, I, want, I want to leave. Like, I don't, <laughs> don't want to. Yeah. Because capitalism is yeah. an infinite game yeah it is to be fair yeah jeff bezos sets his alarm clock every morning to go into work to make more money true does like does, does he make, need to does that make any sense yeah like I, I mean admittedly you might say it's because he like enjoys working uh for amazon but like there, there are very very wealthy people who are still trying to make more and what you have to realize is that there is no we're never going to get to the point where economic growth is high enough or where like we've made enough money where wage growth is going to be high enough where house prices are going to be high like all this stuff is designed to steadily march upwards infinitely so that that's yeah. why i think it is better to leave than to just stay in in the system yeah it's crazy it's crazy it's like it's literally like the matrix financial matrix if if, okay, if well, we're gonna call it that well, right sounding a bit like andrew tate here, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> oh we're nothing like you <laughs> Um, I was wondering, so you've done, you've obviously done a lot of uh, speaking. You talked about speaking. Yes. So, you know, doing live TV and more recently speaking at events. Yes. Um, and you said that was like almost deliberate. Like that's, that's, that's something that you wanted to do. You wanted to, sorry, you wanted to develop I wanted in to, that area. I wanted yeah. to diversify into yeah. offline. Yeah. Because um, the internet, the internet isn't a real place. Yeah. It can often feel like it is, mm. 
but it's really not like the it's a great way to reach people at scale yeah. and it's a great way to try out different creative ideas like videos and like graphics and content and stuff but you you have to leave the house at some point and mm -hmm. go out and, and meet real people and speak to real people think about our relationship for, yeah. for example we've known each other for about four years now yeah. half of that time has been online True. and half of that time has been in person and yeah. like this is clearly the better half that, yeah that that's true together and yeah. stuff so once i saw that covid was almost retreating i was like okay you need to just let go of like the fear let go of the self-doubt you just need to learn how to speak on stage in front of people because that's all part of the mission, right? That's just another way that you can reach people and talk to them about money. Made this decision at the start of um, 2022. Yeah. And yeah, I do maybe on average like one or two talks a month and wow. it's easily like the best part of the job. Yeah. I love meeting people. How did you, I guess, improve in your mind? What did you do to improve? Because like you said, it's, it's an area that you wanted to focus on. So, how, yeah, how do you manage that? I invested in myself. Okay. People say, um, you know, invest in yourself a lot in sort of like an arbitrary kind of concept. But investing in yourself basically means um, learning things which like add to your skill set. But but if you if you compare that if you can like uh, combine that with adding to your skill set in a way that will follow you for the rest of your life, that's where you get the compound returns on your investment. And the thing with public speaking is no matter how old you are, no matter whether you, you know, you're firm, infirm, no matter whether you're like remote or whether you're in the room, yeah. the ability to speak in front of a room of people clearly and articulately is a very high value skill anywhere in the world yeah. and so i invested in my public speaking from early i did a linkedin post by this actually i did a course at city lit like a weekend course wow um, on public speaking i've done toastmasters i've done hoopla's improv i've done hoopla's stand-up course and this year i'm taking voice acting lessons as okay well. what's that voice acting voice at like adverts and like, oh kind of, yeah that's so cool yes because wow. i recognize that each new thing that i add to like my list of public speaking skills just makes me more powerful yeah and um i'll be able to use it for the rest of my life yeah literally that's anywhere in the true. world so that that's the first thing you invest in yourself the second thing i would say is because i i i still do get nervous actually but um what you need to do when it comes to public speaking is and I learned this from my teacher at the City Lit course, is you need to approach public speaking from a position of generosity rather than a position of neediness. And I'll explain what that means. When you approach speaking from a needy perspective, you get up on the stage and you're like, oh, I wonder if they'll like what they'll think about how I look. Will I sound silly? Will I embarrass myself? So on and so forth. And you get on stage. And because you're self-conscious, we've all seen that, right? We've all mm. seen a, a, someone who's self-conscious speak on stage and it kind of makes you feel a bit self-conscious yeah. as well. And it's kind of an unpleasant, unpleasant experience for everyone. That's neediness. That's going on stage or, you know, in your church or like whatever yeah. and needing the people to like you and validate you. Yeah. Public speaking from a position of generosity is going, do you know what? I have expertise in a particular area and all of these people have left their houses to come into this room to listen to me talk about this thing. They want me to succeed. They need my help. Yeah. So what I owe it to them to communicate what I'm going to say to them clearly in a way that's interesting and fun and is going to change their lives. Okay. And if you view speaking from that perspective, you'll still be nervous, but you'll realize that you almost have a mission that you have to achieve that yeah. day. And then it just comes down to practice. So if you know what you're going to say in advance, you don't want to be saying it on stage for the first time. <laughs> you don't want to be in that position. But if yeah. you practice, you know what you're going to say. You know that the people want to hear you say it. Yeah. There's no, there's nowhere for you to go but to succeed. Wow. Wow. That was powerful, man. That's crazy. When you say it from that perspective, I can understand why when you reframe your mind to that point how it could be powerful and how you can really really succeed wow that's that's amazing that's absolutely amazing okay so so we so we talked about the content creation talked about the speaking live tv and a, a, at events talked about books actually as i as i mentioned to you offline 
listeners, watchers, we're recording this at a point where the episode hasn't come out, but you will know that Timmy had a big involvement with uh, Eman's book, right? So get your money right, right? Yep. How did that come about? And from your point of view, what was the process like yeah. of writing that book? I met Emmanuel Asuko for the first time at the UK Black Business Show in 2018. And um, yeah, instantly very likable guy. He was um, exhibiting Noir Excel at the time, as his business was called. He okay. he changed it to the E-Man effect, I think, a couple of years ago. And I, yeah, we just exchanged details and kept in touch. And he was always like a big brother to me. I, I always looked up to him. He's one of the three people that made me realize that you can talk about money on the internet within the UK context yeah. um, a, alongside uh, Martin Lewis and, and Andy Webb of yeah. be, be Clever of Your Cash. So it's like those three that was like, oh, maybe I should do this. And over time, he, we would work on like little one-off projects together. And th it was kind of a, a thing of like, we were building a relationship with each other. We were feeling each other out. We were seeing how we could work together professionally. And then when the opportunity came for him to write the book, he he approached me and because I'd, I'd written for him before like I'd written blog posts for him before and we worked together on the book proposal and then we also worked together on the full book I will Amazing. tell you that writing that book was the second hardest thing I've ever done after running the London Marathon last wow. year I literally poured my heart and soul into writing that book and so did he like it was we had to get it done within three months we ended up doing it in four with the permission wow. of the publisher. Okay. It was weekly calls, interviews, voice notes. We had a Google Doc like this big and stuff. And and if I could be transparent, like the the entire process wasn't like plain uh sailing either. Mm -hmm. Like we had our, our conversations and stuff, but when you're when you're brothers, like you just you just say it how it is. Yeah. Um but I am very proud of him for writing it. He's gone you know, he's spoken publicly about how embarrassed he was to write a book and how he didn't necessarily want to do it. But I'm very proud of him. I understand the book is doing well and will continue yeah. to do well. And um, it, that is, it, it was like a, an, a a privilege and an honor for me to write it because yeah. I don't always have to be the person in the limelight. I like to think of myself as a, as an OS yeah. type person. Okay. I don't I don't have to be the app. Okay. I can be the okay. operating system. Ah, and I like that. I see in many ways, you know, it's my job to help other people to shine. And there are so many things that I help people with. People don't even realize. So many mm. people call me asking for tips on fees and like how stuff should look, how stuff should be written, and I'll just help them. And like it's nothing to me because other people's success is my ex is my success. Yeah. Particularly if they're a black person particularly if it's like another black guy i, I literally like texted the man and i said look I, your success is my success your pain is my pain like i really want this book to do well yeah. because at the end of the day if the um police are going to um shoot and kill someone mm. they're not gonna go oh yeah um shoot the guy with the glasses uh shoot the guy without the glasses they're, they're yeah. literally going to see us as the same and equally yeah. if one of us does well then we all look good. So 100%. I see it as yeah. my job to just help other people look good and succeed. 100%. I love that. I love that about you. You've always been supportive. It's um, that's, that's one of the things I think makes you stand out in the community. And um, yeah, I mean, look, I hope, I, hope, I hope it continues to go well. What I wanted to actually ask you, and you, you mentioned a few things there, right? About obstacles. So... And, I, and I'm glad that you were honest about it not being easy, right? Because it's not four months is crazy quick. I mean, to, it, 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 to, I, I'm, you know, personal finance book that's going to be enjoyable to consume. Four months is not, <laughs> it's not a short time, you know, it's not a long time. Sorry, should I say, you know, it's a short amount of time to I mean, turn takes, something around. It takes longer to make a baby. I mean, so. <laughs> really put it like that, <laughs> that's fact. Some people even take years to write their book. Yeah. Two, three, four years, you know. So I guess... What obstacles did you have to overcome to get it over the line? The main obstacle was writing in Emmanuel's voice. Okay. Because he did, he, he, like he, 
he um he is the author but i wrote the book yeah do you get what i mean yeah. so there are bits in the book which are him speaking directly to the reader like each chapter has like a personal story or anecdote but then there's the more educational parts of the book which are kind of like this is how this thing works this is how the system works so it was very very important of me to make the book because we, we speak completely differently yeah right? like you'll <laughs> go back and listen to emmanuel's um kind of episode but yeah uh we spent so much contact time with each other that it got to a point where when i was writing i just i would like sit write something out how i would write it and i'd be like yeah but how would e-man say this and then i'd write it out in in that way that was the main obstacle and then it's just about yeah just putting the words on on the page and i compared writing the book to running the marathon and they're very very similar like when you're yeah. running you don't just a mar like in the distance like 42 kilometers yeah you don't just sprint from the start line you're gonna burn out and you're gonna hurt yourself you need to pick a, a target pace and then you need to just run steadily at that pace and just know do you know what for the next three four five hours this is the pace that i'm doing yeah and that's something that i had to do for the book um wow. to, to be able to get it done in that period of time wow that's tough that's really tough do you feel like you will i know that you that you got to write your own book and we'll, we'll get onto that shortly. Mm. Do you feel like you want to continue writing for other people? You know, like similar to like what they do in the music industry, you have right people write for Beyonce, all the bigger yeah. stars, right? And yeah. it, there's always that one or two people behind yeah. that. Is that something that you think that you will continue doing? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I can do most things to a decent standard. Mm. As I said, I, I can speak, I can write, I can create content, I can, kind of turn my hands to most things mm. if I'm like given enough time to learn it and I do I do like I'm really inspired by people like Pharrell Williams yeah for example who you go back you're like what he produced that song and he produced that song and he wrote a score for Despicable Me and stuff so I think that's really cool but and this is a learning that I had to make last year and this year I don't want to do it at the expense of like fulfilling my potential right okay and for, and like stepping into myself as well because um like all the times i was doing the lives like i'm happy that i did the lives um i'm happy to work with people on the projects and stuff but i don't want to use these things as an excuse to not you know step into the fullness of my myself so yeah. uh it, if i'm going to be writing books for other people then it needs to be in addition to me yeah writing um uh like my own book okay if i'm going to be interviewing other people then it has to be in addition to me being able to stand on the stage by myself with no yeah. guests and still have something to say okay as well yeah i get that wow that's that's amazing so as a entrepreneur and as a creator why do you think that you've found success i mean my definition of success is like quite different to maybe the standard one i i don't think you need to do anything to be successful i think simply by being a living breathing human being like that's that's success to me genuinely okay. I, i'm not saying that you shouldn't um strive for more and that you that you can't have goals and things yeah. that you want to work on but i'm a huge proponent of of self-love unconditional yeah. self-love um and self-acceptance and so I think that if you, you know, you wake up in the morning and like you're, you know, broadly happy and you get to spend time yeah. with people that you love and you broadly get to do, you know, spend your time how you want to spend it, yeah. that's success to me. I don't think it's a number uh, of followers. I don't think it's like a, <laughs> a, a salary. I don't think mm. it's the amount of net worth. I think it, you get to define your own uh, definition of success. And so from that definition, I think, um, you know, like the day I started Mr. Money Jar and, and wrote my first blog that no one wrote, that no, no one read, you know, that was success. Amazing. Amazing. What do you feel has been like the most challenging thing that you've had to deal with as an entrepreneur? Because it's different to, you know, working um, a nine to five or mm -hmm. working a job. What do you feel like has been the most challenging for you in your journey? I think the most challenging thing for me is this tendency I have to jump from one thing to the other. I possibly could have a much bigger audience, possibly could have made a lot more money if I'd 
stuck to one thing and been like i'm a person that only talks about x or i'm a person that only speaks to like x community but i have kind of danced around a bit okay. but i think that that's also been my strength the fact that i can do lots of different types of things and that yeah. i can speak to lots of different financial disciplines i just need to make sure that i don't trip myself up and that i learn how to focus um because focus is also important too yeah that's what they say right they 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 do say that i don't know i'm on the fence with focus and not focus because there's some people that i've seen out there that have done well with not being so specific as yeah. well but then some people the opposite they've been done very well being specific yeah. the thing the thing that i've learned is um you can do lots of different things yeah they just need to be in the same ecosystem yeah if the stuff that you're doing if you're like doing products over here and then you're just and then you're doing an app over there and then like you're talking over there it may not necessarily all fit so you need to like start with your core thing which in the case for me was like digital content yeah and then the next extension of that was like teaching it in a virtual setting and then the next extension from that was like giving talks about it in the real life setting so yeah. each new thing you're doing that you're adding on makes sense in the ecosystem of all the other things you're doing that's fine um it's just when you're doing lots of disparate kind of activities that don't relate to one another which i could easily do right and it sounds like you're that kind of i'm that well. kind of person 100 um, yeah <laughs> then you're kind of yeah you're you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot yeah yeah i know i you know what i hear it sometimes i do think oh should i just focus a little bit yeah. more on that and i'm like because the fact of the matter i know there's an expectation on content yeah. creators to to like you have your content you have your speaking thing you have your podcast you have your book you have your yeah courses yeah but the thing is one good podcast can change your life true you can spend all your time just working on a podcast that is very very true one really well written book yeah will be sold throughout your lifetime and possibly after you die yeah just constantly very, very like recommended and stuff so um you you can get a lot of success from just one thing yeah yeah i i completely agree you spoke about the importance of building relationships mm -hmm. how have you built relationships in a way that works for you because obviously we all do it in different ways but how have you done it that in a way that works for you i can't remember where i heard this from but i try to offer value to people with no expectation of anything in return okay and i hope that's not come across as weird to anyone because no because if someone's like really nice to you for no yeah. reason yeah any well-thinking person will be like this person wants something from me <laughs> like why are they why are they just helping me why are they being so nice to me yeah but i believe that if everyone and, and it's risky as well because you can be taken advantage of if you just go around just doing things for people without necessarily getting something in return but I think if you do it in good faith, if you just go, do you know, I can, how can I make this person's life better? You plant a little seed in them and when your time comes, they'll help you out too. And that's, yeah. that has worked for me so far. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. I, I, I like that. And I think, again, it, it goes down to what works for you, right? That, that works very, very well for you. You know, I think when, when we talk about building a network building relationships it doesn't have to be forceful always you know always i always have thoughts about it it doesn't have to be forceful it doesn't have to be something like where you go to networking events and then you're having to break the ice with somebody and that's how you build a relationship it doesn't have to be like that right you can build relationships like how we've we built relationship over 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 the years online and it was a, a natural natural thing and i think that's all right again it's going back to that to that point that we were talking about before where we we're talking about patience right i feel like some people they just come in and then they just want to i need to break through the door here i need to break through the door here i need to do this i need to do that just almost forcing it yeah a bit too much and yeah. i feel like it, it can come across sometimes right as well and then you also then start to feel ah oh, gosh i'm tired i don't want to keep on doing this. this is awkward you know it doesn't have to be awkward right it could just be in a way that um that works for you yeah so. you can just be nice to people yeah I think, <laughs> right i think um being nice is massively underrated you can yeah. just build you can build a relationship by literally just being nice because there are people that i have now that are sharing my content on social media that are following um like my various platforms that come to my events that are paying clients 
or have been playing clients yeah. that are people that I either worked with or went to school with and I was just nice to them at that time. If I had not been nice to them at school, if I had been a horrible colleague, when the time came to call someone up to give a talk, they wouldn't have followed at me because yeah. their enduring memory of me would have been of me not being a nice person. So adding value is like a nice thing to do. It's a good thing to do if you can, but you can just have a pleasant and respectful relationship with someone. And then when the time comes, they'll contact you. Love that. I love that. What do you feel like you've learned on your journey as an entrepreneur? Something that you think, oh, wow, I never heard about this. And this is actually what I'm having to deal with. I've actually learned from this this is the classic entrepreneur thing of like you know you build the mvp and then you test it with users and then you see what the feedback is and you rebuild and stuff i'll say like a big thing i've learned is that you could you can have an idea about what you're building and there'll be like a bit of a fuzzy idea but it's not until you then man make it real in the world and people start using it that you'll have a full idea of what it is that you're building so I have an audience of about 20,000 people and most of them are women. Okay. I, just, <laughs> I thought Love that, that. The women support in. I, I thought and I wanted to originally speak to young men. Um, I'm the oldest of three uh, brothers. Okay. Um, my youngest brother, as I've mentioned, is in school at the moment. So I was like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if I like did stuff that like appealed to kind of uh boys that were kind of like school age like uni age and stuff like money stuff and so on actually it turns out that most the the demographic that my content most appeals to is uh the female demographic okay and so i've listened to that and when i create content now i, I talk about childcare, i talk about the gender pay gap i talk about investing for the first time and i take feedback directly from the people that follow me and i will I'll do polls and I'll like ask people for what they want and then I'll make that content. And that that's the content that actually does the best. If I go okay. to an event, I'll say 80%, 75, 80% of the room is full of women. Wow. Um, and back to the point I made before, I think mm. you're, it's a demographic of people that were not the intended beneficiaries yeah. of the capitalist system. Uh, women um, have only been able to open bank accounts in their name in this country since 1975. They wow. only got the vote in 1918, which is barely 100 years ago. So um, you're looking at a group of people that like want to understand the system, want to better themselves. But then also, I think women um, on average, and this is, I'm not saying that this is a fact, this is just mm. my, my sense, <laughs> are a lot more sensible than us men. I think, Probably, yeah. Yeah, like yeah. women want to like gather all the inputs learn about the thing mm -hmm. cooperate work with other people and then invest yep. men want to take <laughs> <laughs> men want to take the you know the hard-earned savings mm -hmm. dive headfirst into crypto mm -hmm. so they can like talk about how they 10x their money um <laughs> crypto bros yeah uh obviously this is like not not all men but we're, yeah. we're just way more likely to display uh behavior than that but um yeah, like you, you don't know what you're going to build until you build it and people start using it. Where do you see Mr. Money Jar in the next five years? That is a very good question. I I just want to be synonymous with learning about money and, and with education more broadly yeah. in, in the UK context. And I'm going to keep it pounds and pence if I can. Okay. I know that there's a like a temptation and a tendency to branch out into the US and stuff. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, within the UK, we have our own tax systems. Pensions work very differently here. Investments work very differently here. Yeah. And I'd really like to serve the UK audience. And um, I'd like to continue to be that OS that mm. works with other people. But then I, that I also create my own products and services from. So you can expect to see me doing a lot more talks yeah. in a lot bigger contexts, books. I'm even like right now looking at everything that's going on with artificial intelligence. I'm very interested in turning Mr. Money Jar into um, an AI a digital Ooh, assistant. That would be interesting. Because actually, sorry, this is a bit of a long winded answer to your question, but like I, I have a hunch about the future of content creation and social media. If you look at a direction it could go in because of artificial intelligence mm. as content creators, 
when you uh, create a, a piece of content, you essentially create a digital doppelganger of yourself, right? Yeah. So people who are watching us say this, we're not actually saying this in real time. Yes. It's based upon stuff that we said in the past, yeah, their past. True. Yeah. But that digital doppelganger that you make is directly tied to what you said in real life. Yeah. And it just repeats, right? So what I think that artificial intelligence will allow us to do is will enable us to animate our digital selves. And so you'll have two selves at the very least. Uh, your real life self that's going around talking to people, offering products and services, giving talks. And then you'll have your digital self that's going around talking to people, yeah. giving talks and offering products and services. Mm. And um, I think... It's really interesting just watching what's going on with like chat GPT and so on. Yeah. So yeah, imagine if like you went on like Mr. Money Jar AI, you got my picture there and like a uh like a search bar and you typed in a question and then it spat an answer back, but it sounded like it was me. Like okay. that's something I'm very interested that's, in. Too. Ooh, that that's so interesting. I never thought of that. That would be so cool. That would be really, really cool. Well, I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to seeing that. So you you mentioned earlier, you know, talked about marriage, right? Mm -hmm. And that unfortunately, um, did you say did you say separated or did you say well, separated? Separated. Um, okay. You yeah, the, you can't get divorced straight away. Like oh really? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know it, the rules. It, yeah, there. it take it takes a minimum six months. And, oh really? Yeah. Okay. Wow. How has that I guess had an impact on you? Because obviously you you know you're on your journey uh, in your business, and then that's happened. How has that had an impact on you? Yeah, it's really interesting. I would say m most things in my life are going well, and it's just uh, on the relationship front. On the relationship front, that things haven't gone to plan. Yeah, it's been uh, very interesting. Um, I'm in Brighton at the moment, so I like moved out of London. Brighton's been a great place to be because I don't know as many people there. Mm. so i can kind of do my thing and then use the weekends to like do stuff like this and see people i want to see uh brighton's a lot smaller than london so you can kind of walk to where you need to get to there's quite an entrepreneurial community there and then of course you've got the beach and mm. there's nothing nicer than after like a stressful yeah. working day to go yeah. down and yeah. just be able to see the sea be able to see the sun set without there being like huge buildings in the way and stuff it's very healing um i must say yeah, me, me, and, me and my wife uh, breaking up. We we unfortunately joined the uh, fifty percent of well, it's forty two uh, percent of marriages that end. But that number is grossly um, understated because there are a lot of people who remain married to each other who mm. are unhappy still, but like either don't have the time, willingness, or inclination yeah. to separate from each other. And yeah, I I, I fundamentally wish her well. Um, I don't uh, wish her any ill will or her family any ill will. Um, and something uh, that I think we both agree on is that if we were to rewind to back when we first met, I was 27, she was 25, that we probably always would have dated at that point in time. It's just that not all relationships are going to go the distance. And then it's probably sensible not to marry those people. Mm. But the thing that I've learned from that is, uh, if I put the financial lens on it, you can be married to someone you can have maxed out your stocks and shares i say you can have bought a uh, um a house together you can have made yeah. all of the whoops sorry you can have made all of the financial investments but you just need to make sure that you invest in memories yeah you need to invest in joy you need to invest in happiness yeah that's um, important. because uh simply having a maxed out you know isa or getting all the like core financial things right isn't yeah. necessarily going to uh, yield the, the dividends that you would like yeah 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 there's something i wanted to ask you actually about marriage and finances sure um because a lot of people as well they also stay in marriages because they're worried about financial stability yes right I guess my question to you is how does somebody work around that? What 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 are the things that they think about if they if they're kind of fearing not fearing for their lives, but they're like, look, if I leave this marriage, I'm gonna be out in the streets, I can't afford rent, I can't that's a that's a serious issue for a lot of financial, people. Financial financial independence. Yeah. 
no, no. Uh, financial. I, I, won't, I won't use that because we associate financial independence with like being able to live off your, yeah. your assets. Yeah. But financial self sufficiency, yeah, is very important, and it's particularly important for women because yeah. we look at relationships and we see that women have lower credit scores on average um, in uh, like uh, relationship breakdowns mm -hmm. uh, where that you know the a couple have had children women will often have like lower savings and lower pensions and that sorts of that sort of thing so even if you're getting into a relationship with someone else you want to be operating your finances in such a way that even if you were to separate from this person that you would still be okay and that requires you to and that's what that's why actually like with um my at the end of my relationship we were actually both able to just like separate quite like cleanly because okay. i had always made sure that in our relationship we were both good as individuals but also good as a couple yeah and like you know still being being able to be nice to each other and be on speaking terms yeah it's also a big thing too because a lot of the costs that come from a uh, divorce come from mediation yeah where, like the two people aren't speaking to each other mm. so financial self-sufficiency very very important to have yeah. uh, in a relationship um and that, that applies to jobs too right like if you save an emergency fund and emmanuel talks about this a lot and your um your manager is speaking like nonsense to you you can just leave because you know exactly. that you have a pot of money over here which can tide you over until the next job yeah 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 i completely agree i think and this is not to say there's anything wrong with joint accounts because i you know i've got i've got a, a joint account um with my uh, partner and i think there's nothing wrong with it but like you said that you know some sort of i know we're trying to say the independence but some sort of independence right of your money right mm -hmm. i think is like you said is important not because you're thinking of oh yeah the rainy day bad yes of course it's always good to protect yourself but it's also just good to know what's going on because for any kind of situation yeah. that could happen right yeah your finances are, are easily something that you can outsource to someone else like your partner in your relationship yeah. or that you can kind of just not look at and bury your head in the sand about but I would really ask people to think about their finances in the same way that they see their health. Like you wouldn't outsource looking after your body or your mental health to someone else. Yeah. Um, but like you, you like largely can't, but you kind of want to see your finances in that way. And that it's your responsibility to educate yourself. Um, it's your responsibility to know what's going on with your finances and, have that be the baseline have that be the non-negotiable baseline 100 percent. it's non-negotiable you're right it's on the same level as health yeah for sure and mental health and yeah. actually like to 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 be fair like i think the pandemic yeah. changed the game for a lot of people Did? um yeah. uh, i think that period of time you know during furlough where people realized that you could lose your primary source of income and that yeah. your circumstances could change quite quickly showed a lot of us that like hey like maybe i do need to have emergency savings yeah. maybe i do need to be like focusing on like how much money is coming in and how much is going out yeah agreed 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 it's been such a great conversation to me man i learned so much i'm glad that we made it happen i'm glad we made the second one i knew i knew it was gonna be fire yeah. um what do you have planned next for yourself yeah i mean if i could talk about something that i haven't already mentioned on the episode yeah. something something else i'm interested in mm. is this is this is gonna sound like crazy <laughs> okay cool i'm bracing myself but, yeah but i don't know it's another one of the experiments that's on my mind at the moment i would really like to pivot mr money jar from being like a financial education company mm -hmm. to being a financial superhero type character okay um yes i i just really like the idea of like a financial superhero that's been sent to earth to uh save the people from the from the clutches of of capitalism um <laughs> and i think it's it's an idea and actually like save evolves she's uh she's actually just come out as a superhero um on her page if you go to her page oh. she's just doing new content around it which is very interesting that's interesting i'm gonna check that we out came up with the uh shout out lv yeah, yeah we came up with this uh same idea within a week of each other because i think that along with this idea of like you have your digital self and your personal self yeah i think the superhero thing is such a good idea like what she's doing because it lends itself to digital products to comics to merchandise to toys mm. um and is like it's fun like most importantly yeah um 
and uh yeah i look forward to seeing what she does with it and it's something that i want to play around with a bit more going forward as well that sounds amazing let me know how that goes because i even though you said <laughs> you know i could see it i can see that vision i can see that working yeah i can see that working it makes it makes complete sense yeah and i think like why call yourself a superhero because mm. it is a bit it's a bit of like a <laughs> silly thing to do i i guess but i i say why not you know yeah. how many times do we tell ourselves that we can't do things and yeah. that we're not good enough for me that's that's just as crazy a thing to tell yourself to tell yourself that you can't do something and that you're not worthy of something i think everyone needs to give themselves a title and a mission that gets them up in the morning yeah. and i actually when i wake up every day because there's some days that i don't want to like work or i'm not feeling up to it yeah i go yeah but if if you were a superhero you wouldn't lie in you would actually like get up and try and help people yeah so give yourself a mission give yourself a title that gets you out of bed in the morning no one's gonna big you up um, yeah. if you can't big yourself up amazing amazing where can people find you they can find me uh at mr money jar just across all social media and um yeah i, I hope to uh see people at an up and coming uh at, at an upcoming event as well amazing amazing yeah like i said man it's been it's been great speaking to you today and hearing your journey and seeing not just witnessing the changes and the the creativity and also hearing from your perspective, the focus on, you know, self-improvement, like deliberate self-improvement. I think that's, it's, it's quite refreshing to be honest, right? Because it shows that if you want to achieve something or if you want to become something, you can do it. It requires work, but you have to also, you have to be deliberate um, in a way, right? Um, and you're also getting to live the life that you want. You're, you're creating that life I'm that very you lucky want. in that regard yeah I, there's very few things I do now that uh, I don't want to do I I generally get I, I get to wake up when I want I get to work on stuff that I that I want I get to spend time with people that I want it's yeah. an enormous privilege and I don't take it for granted and I'll continue to do it for as long as it it keeps uh going amazing do you have any final words for the listeners and watchers practice self-love self-love will, will set you free you when people t you hear phrases like your your uh, net worth is not your self-worth and it's kind of a, a semi-useful phrase but it's not completely useful because it's phrased in the negative so it's telling yeah. you what you're not uh you are actually a worthy human being um that's worthy of love because you're a living breathing person there is no need to tie it to your salary, to your net worth, to your achie your achievements or your your lack thereof. You're, you're fine just as you are. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much, Timmy. It's been great speaking to you. Thank you for having me. Well, very, very welcome. Watchers and listeners, I hope that you've enjoyed this episode of Takeover Experience. I appreciate you listening and watching. See you next week's episode.